So I came here in uh, October 91 and I was looking for a topic for my dissertation and pretty quickly I sat on congestion games. And one motivation was I was interested in, um, in ecology, in things like competitive exclusion. So you climb a mountain and initially you see one bird species and then at some uh, altitude it is replaced by another species. But the first species in another mountain where it has no competitors spreads uh, along uh, a uh, larger uh, set of uh, altitudes. So that's one indication that competition for resources among similar species restricts uh, their pattern, uh, their, their special pattern. And the, the way to model that, naturally, is a congestion game. And back then in 91, not much was known about the congestion games. The uh, first formulation of the congestion game, which was not called that at that period, was Rosenthal's uh, paper from 73. So he, in his model, you have a finite number of players, you have a finite number of resources, and the strategy for a player is a set of uh, resources. Um, for any resource, there's a cost function which determines the cost of the resource as a function of the number of users of the resource. Now, cost is, uh, is essentially a sign convention here. So it doesn't have to be positive, and it doesn't have to be increasing in the number of users. So congestion can actually be a good thing in this uh, model. So here's an example of a congestion game. You have two players. And one player chooses the first and the second resource. He could have chosen the fifth, that is the second strategy. And the other guy chooses uh, one, three, and four. So this is what they pay. One pays uh, the price of the first resource, which is, the, uh, uh, which is affected by both users, plus the cost of the second resource. And a remarkable result by uh, Monder and uh, Shapley is that the congestion games, in a sense, coincide with potential games. So what is a uh, uh, potential game, an exact potential game? Well, a game has a potential if it is similar to a game where everyone has the same pair of function. Similarity here means that the difference between the player's pair of in the first game, in the second game, is independent of his own action. For example, take a two by two symmetric game. This is always going to be a potential game. Why? You have this uh, decomposition. And notice that the matrix on the right, your pair of there, C or B, only depends on the other guy's action. Which means that P is a potential for this game. Why is that important? It is important because similarity preserves everything which is determined only by unilateral moves. So an equilibrium, an actual equilibrium is an example. It only depends on the difference in payoff when you are the only player changing his strategy. Therefore, the uh, two similar games have precisely the same set of Nash equilibrium. And if in one game everyone gets the same payoff, then the set of equilibria is quite nice. Uh, nice in what sense? Well, it's non empty. And moreover, in a potential game, you have the finite improvement property, meaning that if I change my strategy, then another guy changes his strategy, and so on. And every such change of strategy is good for the changing player then this chain cannot go forever. At some point, they hit an equilibrium. 
This is true for P, and this is therefore true also for the original idea. The, 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 potential, the, the congestion is given in the previous slide. This is more general than the Rosenthal game? Oh, this is precisely the Rosenthal game. Yes, it's precisely. Precisely the Rosenthal game. For which the potential yes. theory. Yes, and Modern Sharply showed that a game is a potential game if and only if it can be represented as a congestion game. So a coincidence. I was saying that it's equivalent. If I can only choose one or I can choose a subset, it will be in, equivalent. In, it's not equivalent, but in Rosenthal's... Yeah, in in, 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 in Right. If your claim is correct, then it should be the same. So it's a potential game, that's true, but not all potential games have this form. Can you remember the single resources? It will be multiple. Okay, so that's the uh, <coughs> next slide. Singleton congestion game. In a singleton congestion game, you can only choose one resource. And this is a very natural assumption in some contexts. Another uh, uh, natural assumption is that uh, uh, congestion is bad for you. So the cost functions are non-decreasing. They can increase, they can stay constant. They can be positive or they can be negative. Uh, if you adopt these two assumptions, which I'm going to, the, the second one I'm going to adopt from this point on, then there are some ways you can extend the general, the, the, the basic notion of a congestion game. For example, by introducing weights. Weights means that it's not the number of users that count, but their total weight. So some players have higher congestion impacts than others. So that's the, the example. This is a singleton game. They choose just one resource, and each player has his own weight, and the cost is affected by the total weight. Another extension is player-specific <coughs> costs. So again, we are back to unit weights, but the cost is uh, player-specific. Not everyone plays, pays the same. So congestion is bad, but to a different degree for different players. So this is the example. It's just that player one plays C one one. So the uh, 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 the upper one is the index of the player, and this is what the second guy plays. What properties do these games have? Well, they don't have all the properties of Rosenthal's congestion game, but they have some of them. Weighted congestion games do not have an exact potential. <laughs> But they do have the finite improvement property, which uh, means that in some sense they do have a kind of generalized potential. Congestion games with player specific don't have the finite proof property. Nevertheless, they always have an equilibrium, a pure static equilibrium. They have another property which is stronger than existence of equilibrium, quite remarkable, which is called sequential solvability, which means the following. You take um, any finite game, which is a simultaneous move game, and you make it a sequential move game. They move one after the, the other, and there's perfect information. You know what the other guys did. After they choose their actions, their strategies, they get their payoffs from the original game. So in the context of a congestion game, this will look like that. They enter the game one after the other. Now. Suppose that what they do here is the equilibrium path uh, in the extension for game. Does that imply that this configuration is an equilibrium in the simultaneous move game? Well, in this case, the answer is yes. Of course, in general, this is not true. The sequential move version of a game looks very different from the original game. Right? Think matching pennies. Think Jewish poker. You choose a number, then I choose a number, and the higher number wins, right? The simultaneous move uh, version of the game is, is quite different from the uh, sequential move one. Um, you're saying it goes both ways. The equilibrium set of the sequential coincide with the equilibrium set of the... Well, uh, not precisely, so I'll be more precise here. A game is sequential solvable if, for any ordering of the players, there's a sudden and perfect equilibrium such that the equilibrium path is an equilibrium in gamma. Generically, there's only one sudden and perfect equilibrium. 
And the uh, signal to congestion gains with pair specific costs are sequentially solvable. They have this property. But interestingly, Rosenthal's congestion gains are not. And the reason that these gains are not singleton gains. This is the, the crucial uh, difference. So that was uh, mid 90s. Fast forward to today. Today, much of the work in congest on congestion games it is done on network congestion games. And much of the work is done by computer scientists. Here's an example of a network congestion game. In a network congestion game, the resources are edges in a network. And a strategy is a path from the common origin of the players to the common destination. Not every edge is necessarily allowable to all players. So in this example, some are allowed only to one, some are only allowed only to two, and some are allowed to both. So obviously for both players, there are two ways to go from O some to D. The cookie. The edge? Yeah. There is no edge from O to D. That's, that's what it means, not allowed anymore. Ah, okay. You're joking, right? No. <laughs> you are joking. Anyway, this is a two by two game, right? And this is the uh, uh, these are the uh, cost functions. These are uh, these are player specific costs. Um, the costs may have two arguments, one or two, and one is not written here because it's always zero. And this is the normal. Is it okay? Hmm? Zero when the argument is one. The cost of one, when there's only one player, the cost is zero. Otherwise, it's positive. So the edge chosen by just one person is, uh, is free? Yes, yeah, this is just an example, no, no, nothing okay. general. And this is the, uh, the normal form of the game. So these are the costs, which are minus, uh, sorry, these are the pairs, which are minus the costs. And obviously, this is completely general. We could, took and we can, we could take any two by two game and construct a network for that. What about the weighted version? So here's the weighted version. Here the, the weights are one and two for the two players. Same network. These are the cost functions. Well, the argument could be one, two, or three. Three when they both use the edge. In this case, it's always zero. So the costs are increasing, right? Or at least non-decreasing. And this is the uh, normal form of the game. Again, it's completely general. We could take any two by two game and stitch a game, uh, a network congestion game for that two by two game. But you could have done it without the weight. The weight? You just said you could do oh, it yes. without no, the no, weight, assembly no. with the weight. Right, so no uniqueness, just existence of a representation. So this is an example of a representation of a two by two game as a network congestion game. So um, this is the, uh, general, uh, the general picture of what we have here in the context of network congestion games. So we have n weighted network congestion games which generalize the singleton case. Why generalize? Because if the network is a parallel one, then it's a singleton game because you choose an edge and you are affected only by those who choose that same edge. In some contexts, it's, uh, it's useful to have the additional assumption that the number of strategies is non increasing with weights. So lighter uh, players have at least as many strategies as the heavier uh, players. Then you have a special case of unweighted network congestion games where everyone has unit weight. Then you have the generalization of that. The weights are still unit weights, but the costs are player specific. So the unweighted is the intersection of the other two. Now, what special properties do these three kinds of game have? Well, the unweighted ones are a special case of Rosenthal games. So they are potential games. What about the other uh, two classes, the weighted games, for example? Well, the weighted, uh, weighted games 
Uh, we just saw an example of a two by two game. And as I told you, every two by two game can be present, represented by such a weighted network congestion game. Which means that such a game does not necessarily have an equilibrium. But the existence of, the existence of equilibrium, pure. I'm, to, I'm talking about pure equilibrium. But the existence of pure equilibrium was the lowest common domain, de denominator of all the properties I mentioned. The finite improvement property, sequential solvability, all implied existence. So they don't have any of these properties. So what special properties do they have? Well, two questions. One for weighted, the other one for place-specific so is uh, Yes, because of the two examples I just showed you, which proves that even for two-by-two two games, existence... Yeah, they are, they are completely right, it, for in the two-by-two two case, it's completely also, general. Okay. Right. So what special properties? As it turns out, they have no special properties at all. And the reason they can have no special properties is that everything is a weighted network congestion game. Every finite game can be represented as such a game. And similarly for a game with player-specific costs. So we have this result. Every finite game gamma can be represented both as a weighted network congestion game and as one with player-specific costs. Can they be one and the same, the same game? Well, if it's the same game, then by definition, it's an unweighted network congestion game. So it must be a potential game. So being a potential game is a necessary condition. It turns out it's also a sufficient condition. So we have the second theorem. We said the game can be represented as an unweighted network congestion game, if and only if it can be presented as Rosenthal's congestion game, if and only if it's an exact potential game. So this extends the result of Modern and Shapley. In what sense? If you have a potential game, it can be presented not only as a congestion game, but as one in which the costs are non-decreasing, um, and the set of strategies are the routes, the allowed routes for the player in some uh, network. Is that a good representation that can go from the horizontal game to your game? So it sounds like going from edges to, to vertices. So like the dual graph of something. Uh, what, what is mine game? The game is getting bullet number one. Yes. The game is getting bullet number two. Mm -hmm. They sound like dual graphs for some reason. <coughs> okay, uh, actually, actually, okay, so let me get to the proof. Uh, actually, the proof uh, is a variant of the proof of Mondor Shapley, but there's a trick needed there. And to explain the trick, how much time do I have? More than five minutes. More than five minutes. So uh, let me start with uh, theorem one. <laughs> Let me, let me start with uh, theorem one. How do we uh, prove that there is a representation? Let's try, let's start with the uh, uh, player specific case. Yes, yes, that's true. That, so that's a pretty, pretty easy. Think uh, uh, at, um, a matrix game. So you have rows and you have columns. So initially for each cell, which is a strategy profile, you associate an edge. And initially, these edges are just free-floating in space. Now you start connecting them by edges which are private to a player. You start with the row player, and you connect all these edges into one root. And you do the same for the second one, and then you uh, fuse the, the edges. And you do the same for the, uh, for the uh, column player. And now they take a root, and where do they meet? They meet at the cell, which represents the actual strategy profile. So you give, uh, the, you associate with this cell costs, which are minus the pairs for the player for this strategy profile. That's pretty easy. What about the weighted case? Doesn't work. Why? Because when they are all using the same edge, 
they are also paying the same cost. They affect the cost differently because the cost depends on the aggregate, on the total weight, but they pay the same. doesn't work. So we need a tree here. What's the tree? Don't look at the edges which a player shares with everyone else. Look at the edges he shares with no one else. What does that mean? It means that these are the edges that correspond to his strategy, but strategies of all the others which are not the true strategies. So if you know that he is using this uh, edge, you know something about what the others are doing, but you don't know what they are doing. However, if you have the whole set of edges of this kind, then you know what they are doing. And it turns out that this information is extractable in a weighted network congestion game. Why? Because when a player is the sole user of an edge, his uh, weight is the argument of the cost function, and you can uh, 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 target that value in a way that collectively all these edges give the right cost to the players. And in fact, what I just described is a system of linear, linear equations, which turn out to have a neat closed form solution. And this is uh, the solution we need to get the representation. And for the second theorem, a variant of this idea also works. And now I have less than... More than five minutes. More than five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. No no um, theorem one is both uh, good and bad. Well, it, it's bad in the sense that, uh, well, too bad, they don't have any special properties. <coughs> it's good in the sense that now you know that every finite game can be represented in a specific form. And the next question is, what does this representation tell you about the game? Specifically, having partial information about representation may be sufficient to say something about the game. Like what? Like the existence of equilibrium. What partial information? Well, the network used. So here we have uh, uh, three networks. And we have some finite game, any number of players, which is represented on one of these graphs. Can we say, just from just looking at the, the graph, at the network, that the game has a pure strategy equilibrium? Notice that these are undirected networks. The idea being that the directions of the edges are part of the specification of the game rather than the topology of the network. So consider the parallel network on the left. Right, right. Right. In this example, that's true. In the right, one the right, only. Yeah, but in the middle, you also you can have a path, a zigzag path that goes back a little bit. Oh, no. So, so it's, it's, it's a route. But yeah, I, sh I should have said that. A route, by definition, is a simple path. So yeah. you don't go back to the. Uh, no, but. Oh, oh yes, yeah, you are. Right. Yes. You can do that. Oh, yeah, good point. Okay, sorry. Right. So the one on the left, the parallel network, the, the answer to the question, the answer to the question is yes. Any weight and energy congestion gain on this network has an equilibrium. Why? Because this is a singleton game, right? And we know that a singleton game, an equilibrium exists. What about the middle network? Well, we already know the answer to this, which is no. Why? <coughs> because every two by two game can be presented on this network, and not every two by two game has a pure strategy equilibrium. What about the Wheatstone network of the Breast Paradox fame? Is it a good one or a bad one? Well, in this story, it's a good guy. An equilibrium exists. Okay, so what's the general <coughs> rule? Okay, here's the general rule. 
what you have to look at is the, is the roots that go from O to D and the edges these roots share. On the left, there are no shared roots. Four roots, no shared edges. In the middle, there are four roots and they share edges. However, they share an edge in the same direction. For example, uh, this uh, edge is transverse in the same direction by this root and by that root. And the same for all the other edges. But not here. Here you have four roots, but this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. And three and four disagree about the direction of that edge. Like following a suggestion, that's what we want to do one. Because the two edges on the side, you are also in both directions, depending whether you take a root like this or the root that goes this way. Okay, so we need a theorem. Right. Here's the theorem. Uh, for a two network network that is not made of two or more such network connecting series, I'll return to this uh, condition in a minute, the following conditions are equivalent. Every weighted congestion network congestion game of G has a pure subject equilibrium, and there is no quartet of origin destination routes in which some pair shares an edge, but no pair transverses any edge shared as in opposite direction. And in the middle network, there is such a quartet. Therefore, this is a bad network. Uh, yes, sure. <coughs> what is a quartet? Quartet of Forsan. There is a quartet of origin destination routes in which some pair is shared by, shares an edge, but every shared edge is transverse in the same direction. With your permission, I will turn to the, to the example to, to, to explain this. So here, here there are four roots that share edges among them, but every shared edge is transversed in the same direction by the roots that share it. Among the four, there are additional roots, right? But there are four roots with this property. And the existence of such a quartet tells us that it's not true that every game has an equilibrium. There are games without equilibrium. Right, right. Okay. That's an if and only if. And what about the initial condition? Well, uh, that's, that's pretty simple. Suppose you have a two sub network and you connect them in series, right? So you have one game and another game, and then you have a third game. But what is this uh, third game? It's what's known as the superposition of the two games, meaning that you play one game on one route, and you play the other game independently of the first, and you get the sum. So an equilibrium means an equilibrium here, an equilibrium there. So it's enough to analyze networks which are not made of some networks and nothing serious, and this is what the theorem refers to. And there's an open question here. What happens about the uh, player-specific costs? I don't know. That's an open, open problem. Thank you very much. So now we have uh,